Hi, and welcome back to our GCP Mindset channel and all topics on clinical research. Today, we present the first part of our web seminar on risk-based monitoring and risk-optimized approaches to clinical trials. We start with an introduction. What is risk-based monitoring and what regulatory requirements are there? What I want to talk about today, first, I would like to uh, talk about what risk-based monitoring even is and why we need it. And this contains a small spoiler because I could also ask, do we need it? Yes, we do. Uh, and uh, I'm gladly going to tell you why. Then uh, also, I want to give you some perspective from a regulatory point of view, uh, whether it's any good, um, whether it is demanded or requested to do it. And from there, I would like to go into a little bit more details on the implementation of such a concept. What does it entail and how can we implement it in our day to day work? And of course, I don't uh, own a crystal ball and with which I can look into the future, but I have some ideas where we are and of course, what we also need to move forward. And I think especially the past two years have made that abundantly clear. And on that, I would also like to briefly comment. So. To start getting everyone on board, because we have a very mixed and diverse background of people here today, uh, let's briefly reiterate what monitoring is. And uh, for those of you that do this on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, it may be uh, you have a very clear indication of what is contained in this definition, but overall, as it's laid out in ICHE 6, it is very general. It is the act of overseeing the progress of the clinical trial and ensuring that it's conducted, recorded, reported in accordance with the protocol, standard operating, standard operating procedures, as well as good clinical practice. And of course, all of the applicable regulations. So none of this says, and this has of course been a, an interpretation of this, that you should do source data verification to the fullest extent possible for all of your clinical trial data. This was, however, an interpretation that was also heavily driven from a CRO point of view, the approach to clinical monitoring for the longest. Of course, we had different settings. We didn't readily have electronic data available at the time, but things have changed and we, have, we are still stuck in a lot of cases with a too high percentage of source data verification. And even these days, we are confronted often enough with the approach of 100% source data verification in our clinical trials. And that's something, of course, that can really be optimized um, and that should also be optimized. And we should move away from this approach of really source data verifying everything. Why should we do this? Well, the first point is very obvious, and that's costs. Monitoring is among the most expensive parts of your clinical trial that you can have. Uh, there are different studies to it from different time points that estimate the cost that monitoring has in your overall study budget. Uh, I can say that from our own personal experience, as far as direct service costs are considered in such a full service project, uh, it can even rack up to 30%, but somewhere between 10 and 20% or 25% is something that you will regularly see. And spending this much money on quality control uh, rather than quality assurance is, of course, something that should critically be reviewed, especially in light of the increasing complexity of clinical trials and with increasing complexity, also massively increasing prices of clinical trials. You see here in the top left from a recent publication from Moore et al. Uh, from 2020, the costs of clinical trials separated by number of patients that are included. And you can see that even for smaller trials, the average costs associated with running one clinical trial are northwards of uh, five million dollars. Uh, and of course, if you spend, let's say, a quarter of that money, which is still more than one million, just on source data verifying your data, yeah, it's of course clear that this is a huge chunk of money and a lot of resources and efforts put into it. And so, the question rises as to whether we have more efficient alternatives now that a lot of data is available also centrally and electronically. And uh, if we are uh, looking at uh, how this monitoring effort is sort of like composed, we can identify some things that we probably always will need to do to some extent. Even this dogma I would challenge. Um, there can also be trials and we have also run trials in the past that have 
exactly zero on-site monitoring, zero source data verification or source data review. Um, but in a lot of cases, you would have general GCP compliance uh, reviews by monitors. And a lot of the remaining source data verification can also be allocated to different types of review and monitoring and maybe some different strategies to approaching it. And that, of course, will then automatically save a lot of time and save a lot of effort. And this is basically where risk-based monitoring comes into play. Now, risk-based monitoring uses a mixture of on-site, remote, and statistical monitoring, and basically finds a concept, a rationale to which parts should be used in what intensity and what frequency by using risk evaluations and letting this, these risk evaluations guide the decision on the intensity of the individual parts of monitoring that you do. It starts by identifying risks in the trial conduct or with the data that is being assessed. And then these risks are monitored and the intensity and frequency of the monitoring is adjusted as needed. And it's a continuous process in which this evaluation and identifying new risks is repeated over and over again. So the monitoring frequency and intensity is adjusted based on the risk profile of the overall study, but also adjusted on the risk profile of individual study sites. And that means you don't need to monitor data at all sites in the same intensity within the same trial. The good thing is, this approach is also supported, if not requested, by both the FDA and EMA. And I will get into some of the regulatory guidance also in the next slides. Now, we do have these components of risk-based monitoring, on-site statistical and remote monitoring. And for me, as a well, primarily also statistician, uh, I like to view this always in line of what data I gather. Of course, outside of the data that is being gathered within a clinical trial, you also have a lot of processes, a lot of compliance documents that need to be checked. But if we are for a moment just looking at the clinical trial data, the historic approach was to simply on-site monitor all of it. And this just does not consider the risk profile. And I think it is very easy to rationalize that different data points should have different levels of importance when you're reviewing data. You would probably agree that the primary endpoint data of a clinical trial, or for example, adverse event information of a trial, are much more important to data integrity, to patient safety, and to patient rights than, for example, concomitant medication or patient's medical history, or a questionnaire on patient reported outcome. So if you naturally look at the clinical trial data based on their, the impact, if there were any issues identified with it on the overall trial evaluation and the overall data integrity and patient safety and patient rights, I think you will find it easy to dissect them into different categories. For example, critical data, data that is really important for the trial, that is only important for the trial, and then you have a lot of other data. And from our experience, usually, especially what, is, what I would categorize as other data, contains a lot of information. If we are looking at, for example, uh, a very, uh, let's say, unhealthy study population, for example, in cancer trials, they would have a, you know, massive medical history, as well as a lot of concomitant medication. And just reviewing all of this can amount to as much work as reviewing the rest of the patient's data. And in the trial evaluation, this information is not even considered really to a high degree. So this lends itself to a rationale of saying, we dissect our information and we use, for example, remote monitoring on a large part of our data. No one even confirms it uh, on the study site. And only part of the information is then reviewed during on-site monitoring through source data verification or source data review. Of course, remote monitoring findings can trigger on-site confirmation by the monitor if everything was actually okay, if everything was actually fine. But this helps us already dissect the information in our trial. And if we go one step further, we can also use statistical methods to monitor all of our trial data. And from those findings that we get through automated statistical methods, we can then confirm them through remote monitoring if they should be queried, if they should be escalated to the study site, and from them also have a reduced amount of on-site monitoring. And this really helps 
shift a lot of effort away from traveling to the sites, being dependent on reviewing the source data, to doing work centrally, standardizing work across study sites, and of course, saving time and saving money ultimately. So this is the perspective where we can say this is the benefit it can have. This is the amount of time it can save. But of course, you could make an argument that on-site monitoring is actually necessary and that you need it to control the quality of your trials. And this has actually been debated also a lot. Uh, and luckily, we have had a number of studies that have come out now in favor, actually, of risk-based monitoring. And I would like to highlight two of these. Uh, the first one is the START trial. It was, it's an actual clinical trial. Uh, they are studying patients with HIV. It was conducted from 2009 through 2013. And it's a randomized controlled trial. And within this trial, a sub-study was conducted in which study sites were randomly allocated to either be remotely monitored or be monitored through a combination of remote and on-site monitoring activities. And of the 196 sites that were eventually allocated to uh, the two monitoring types, there was a comparison at the end in this sub-study sub to identify whether there were more monitoring findings when only remote monitoring was used or when a combination of remote and on-site monitoring was used. Now, without going too much into detail, overall, the authors could find that there were, of course, more findings when people went to the study site and performed on-site monitoring and source data verification. But the things they found were of very limited importance to the trial, to the trial integrity, and also to the patient safety and patient rights. So, they concluded that based on all of these findings, the amount of time and money that was spent into on-site monitoring just did not justify, um, was not justified based on the outcome that they observed. And to quote a more recent study in 2017, um, there was another, uh, I would say, randomized controlled trial that was published. It included 213 sites in 11 trials. It is more of a meta-analysis, um, so 213 sites in 11 trials um, in this approach. And basically, there was a random allocation once more of monitoring strategy, either risk-adapted or extensive, which means basically full source data verification. And what the authors tried to conclude is whether post-study audits could identify more findings in the risk depth study or in the extensive study. And what you can see below is a graph of the findings. And in the middle, let me just move my mouse over. In the middle here, you can see this gray line indicates where there is no difference. The green line indicates where there is a strong benefit for the risk adapt uh, type of monitoring. And the red line is where uh, it gives a benefit to the extensive monitoring. And what we can clearly see from this slide is that almost all of the study basically don't show a difference. And if anything, there is a slight tendency that risk-adapted studies performed better than those with very extensive amount of monitoring. So in summary, we see that scientific evidence prospectively collected supports the claim that risk-based approaches to monitoring are actually beneficial for data quality, or at least not detrimental to data quality, and certainly provide a lot of advantages in terms of effectiveness, in terms of saving money and resources. And especially in a time in which clinical trials are challenging for sponsors to perform because of high burden of costs, this is something that should really be considered. And that's something that is also echoed and has been echoed actually for a long time by the regulators. And now we can see that there are not really specific regulations that you know, regulatory requirements towards our monitoring strategy. There is no regulation that would tell you you need to do source data verification. There are regulations that tell you among others, on-site monitoring and source data verification can be used but all of them state that you should have a rationale for the extent of monitoring that you perform. And of course, we have differences regionally between Europe, uh, US and internationally. Of course, there are also more for China and Japan. They also have their own regulations, um, but to keep a focus on these countries now. 
And there are many additional guidance documents and updates to uh, our legislations that also reflect once more on the specific use of risk-based monitoring. Internationally, we have the ICHE6 Addendum R2, which had a huge push in 2017 towards risk-based approaches to monitoring, but quality management overall as well. We also have the ICHE8 Addendum R1, which will be uh, effective from April of this year onwards. And of course, then we have the guidance documents uh, from the FDA and the EMA in 2013, which also once more highlight and actually pushed for sponsors and CROs alike to adapt risk-based monitoring into their approaches to clinical trials. Now, for those that have worked a little longer in the space, I'm sure you're aware that although we have now had for almost 10 years, regulators push for more risk adapt monitoring strategies, that this has not found its way into day-to-day -day life. At least, of course, until COVID hit. And I think then it was picked up a lot more. And we can see here highlighted below as well, there was an update to the FDA guidance for industry on risk-based monitoring in 2021 still, at least the Q&A part. And there are also guidances on managing COVID uh, trials and, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, which were released also by the FDA and the EMA in 2021. And these really once more emphasize the push for more risk-based monitoring. And of those, I would like to present just two excerpts. The first one is from the FDA guidance document in which we clearly see a push for replacing on-site monitoring through remote monitoring during this health emergency and using a risk-based approach to also specifically prioritize sites that would benefit more from remote monitoring and using centralized monitoring tools to guide this decision, to guide this risk-based process and to accumulate information about the site performance to make this decision. Now, the EMA, on the other hand, also pushed for it and said that monitoring activities should be adjusted to include still on-site monitoring, but also centralized monitoring and central review of data, off-site monitoring or remote monitoring. And they even put in remote source data verification, of course, as typical for the EU with a small and well, not so small asterisk, when in line with EU or national law, which basically prohibits remote source data verification in almost, if not all European countries due to general data protection regulations. Nevertheless, we do see that we have guidance documents that push for an implementation. And of course, that is quite beneficial for us. So much for today. And please come back for part two next week. We hope that we could give you some interesting information and look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.